Today we're working our way through, through chapter 2 of Second Peter, and we're coming to some important verses that shed light on, on several things, but, but one notable thing is we get an insight onto the nature and, and the character of God and how God's unchanging ways, His unchanging nature is, is really the foundation for our comfort and, and our hope in this world. And so what we have in our text this morning is really, is really kind of unique. It's, it's like a, a Bible lesson from the Apostle Peter. Peter's going to give us a lesson in Old Testament studies we could think of. And he's going to show how Christians can, can rightly apply God's Word and, and the promises of, of judgment and rescue how we can see and apply those truths to our lives as we await the, the future judgment, the ultimate final judgment and rescue for the godly. So let's hear from God's word this morning. Be reading 2 Peter 2, starting in verse 4. We'll end in verse 10. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed, distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are always grateful for your word and the opportunity to come and, and learn from you. We thank you for this text. Thank you for the, the truth contained in it of that, that your past faithfulness, your past judgment can give us certainty of your future faithful rescue and judge, judgment. Pray that you would grow us in our love for your word, that you would grow us in our love for you. We pray this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Is God different in the Old Testament? It's a pretty commonly held belief among many, and it makes sense on the surface at, at some level there does seem to be a, a greater emphasis on, on God's wrath and, and judgment against sin in the Old Covenant era. There are accounts, like we just read, of God's worldwide judgment and, and utter destruction of all human life except for, for Noah and his family in the, in the narrative of the flood. There's the depiction of the judgment against the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and bringing them to extinction, as Peter says in our text. There's the putting under the ban, the, the annihilation of the nations opposed to God as the, God's people enter the promised land. And there's, there's more accounts of God's wrathful judgment, his judgment against sin and destruction of sinners as we read our Old Testaments. And the thinking goes, well, if you look at the New Testament, there seems to be a lot more emphasis on love, a lot more emphasis on forgiveness. Jesus tells us to, to pray for our enemies and to turn the other cheek when we are sinned against. No longer are God's people, the church, to use, to use corporal or, or physical punishment and the means of the state to punish sin. We are a spiritual community that is now separated from the state, and, and the state means of punishment in the way that, that ancient Israel, or Old Testament Israel, was, was not. And all of that is, is completely true. 
But I would submit to you that, that it's a faulty leap to understand the changes we see in the new covenant era coming from some change in God himself and God's relation with humanity, or, or even a change with God's dealing with sin and, and the judgment of sin and sinners. Brothers and sisters, God does not change. He is the unchanging God. This is what we confess when we say that God is immutable. He does not change. And our text this morning in Second Peter gives us good evidence of this. As the Apostle Peter is going to cite the, the judgment of the wicked in the Old Testament as evidence for the certain judgment of the wicked in the future. So one big underlying principle that's important to take note of at, at the outset here is that Peter's working with the belief and disposition that God is always the same. The same yesterday, the same today, the same tomorrow. And God's unchangingness is actually the means for, for our, for Christians, full trust in him. And one of the key themes that, that's present all over the scriptures, especially if you think like a place in a place like the book of Psalms, and one of the key themes that we see in the text here from, from Peter is this, past events of God's judgment and salvation prove the certainty of his future promises. And friends, that only makes sense with the foundational belief that God does not change. That is what's underneath the, the scriptural theme that we see over and over again of past remembrance of God's judgment and rescue. Now, as we look to our text in, in 2 Peter, we need to remember what we saw last week in, in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. And what Peter taught in verse 3 is that God is going to judge the false teachers, these, these false teachers that have infiltrated the church and they've deceived the people of God by distorting the message of the gospel. And Peter says these statements in, in 2 Peter 2, 3, that there, that is the, the false teachers, condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep meaning that God is going to repay and punish those teachers that, that claim to be teaching in his name, but are in fact, again, distorting the truth of the gospel. As we saw last week, God is not asleep, as in he will one day bring these false teachers to destruction. And in verses 4 through 10, so, so our text this morning, Peter does something very interesting and I think extremely effective. So what we see here is, is one long conditional sentence. It's an if-then statement. I'm sure we're all familiar with these types of, of sentences. It's a conditional in the sense that the conclusion is conditioned or it's dependent upon the premise or the, the initial statement. So one example of this if-then statement from the sports, sports world is if the Houston Astros make the playoffs, then they will certainly make the AL Championship Series. That's for my Mariners fans. <laughs> or even a more simple one that was proven to me this week, if it's raining outside, then the roads will be wet. <laughs> so notice the concluding premise is dependent on the initial premise. And this is the structure of, of this long sentence that we see in chapter 2. So you can notice then in verse 4, we see the word if, and then a whole host of premises from Peter, five to be exact, which we're going to work our way through. And then if you look all the way down to, to verse 9, we see the word then, right? This clues us into the concluding premise. So all that to say, verses 4 through 8 are the statements that Peter is using as evidence or, or grounding of his conclusion, which he's going to state in verses 9 through 10. And this is helpful because it makes the point of the passage extremely clear. Because the conclusion that the evidence is supporting is the central primary point. So we could say our, our main point in the text this morning is, is this. That we can be certain that God will punish the ungodly and preserve the godly. 
We can be certain that God will punish the ungodly and preserve the godly. And the reason we can be certain of God's coming future judgment and punishment of the wicked and deliverance of the righteous is because that is what God has always done. That's, that's the logic in Peter's teaching here. God is consistent with his own character. He does not change. And so that's why Peter cites the Old Testament examples that he does and why those citations of these events are, are credible or why they should provide us certainty to us. So we're going to break down our time by, by looking at three points. The first one is going to be the, the most amount of time by far, so don't get nervous. <laughs> so first we're going to look at the Old Testament examples of God's judgment and rescue. Then we'll see the, the punishment of the ungodly and finally, the preservation of the godly. So let's first just examine these Old Testament examples of God's judgment and rescue that, that Peter gives us in the text. So the first example that Peter gives is the most debated as we think about what event Peter is referring to. We read in verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, first question we need to ask is, what sin of the angels is Peter referring to? And there's some who think this is a reference to a pre-fall or, or pre-Genesis, pre-creation event, that, that some angels followed Satan in his rebellion against God, and, and they were cast out of God's presence. And there are a couple of texts like Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 17, and, and Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19, which, which some scholars think are referenced to this fall of Satan and the angels before the creation of the world. So some think Peter is referring to that event. But I don't think, personally, I don't think that's what Peter has in mind here, even if there is a pre-creation fall of angels, even if that is a true event that did occur. It's not necessarily what Peter has in mind here. I think Peter's making reference to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, you can turn there if you'd like, verses 1 through 4. And in Genesis 6, what we see is that some referred to as the sons of God found human women attractive and they had relations with them. There's also much debate about what, what this is talking about in Genesis specifically. But verse 4 of Genesis 6, we see the Nephilim are made and they were mighty men of old from the, the relations of these sons of God and the, the human women. Now one common, and this is really important, this is the classical Jewish interpretation, which no doubt Peter is very familiar with, but the Jewish account of this story is referring to angels referred to as the sons of God in the text, right? Coming to earth and sinfully engaging in sexual relations with human women and creating offspring, which, which are the Nephilim. And it's this event that I think Peter is, has in mind in, in 2 Peter 2, 4. And I think the reason for this is, is multiple. First, it fits most neatly with the chronological ordering of the other events that Peter cites. So Peter cites the flood that comes right after this story in Genesis 6, and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19. Also, the, the theme of God's punishment against sexual perversion is a large theme in the, the other two stories of God's judgment. And something, this is really key, something that the false teachers, remember, are promoting sexual perversion. And probably the best evidence that, that Peter's referring to this event with the angels in Genesis 6 is that if we look over to Jude, who references the same event as well as the event in, in Sodom, and Jude makes a pretty clear connection in Jude 6 and 7. He writes, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling... He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, 
just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, right? Notice that word likewise. Jude says Sodom and Gomorrah likewise engaged in, in sexual sin and unnatural desire, which implies that the reference before did as well, which the reference before are, are what? The angels. Now, now Peter says these, these angels, some of them who engaged in the sin were, were cast into hell. They were committed to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the day of judgment. It's a very interesting phrase, and I think it teaches something very important, very important just the theological truth that we must hold. Christians have rightly understood the, the, these fallen angels as demons, the, so those supernatural beings that, that work in, in concert with their master, the devil, and they, they exist to torment, to deceive the world. They stand opposed to God and his ways. But notice how Peter describes them. They are presently, right now, committed to chains, being kept until the day of judgment. Committed to chains. What does being kept in chains tell us? Well, chains are a reference to, to bondage. These demons are not free, free in the sense that they, they can't do whatever they, they desire to do. They can't do whatever they please. The language that Peter uses and, and Jude uses the same language tells us something very important about God. In his righteous punishment of these fallen angels, he is still in complete control over them. They are in his chains that he has committed them to. They are being kept until the final judgment by God in chains. So this verse, along with the, the host of other scriptures, like the, like the book of Job, most notably, they, they teach us that demons and their master, master the devil, are, are not some competing force with God. They're not on, on the same level with God. They stand opposed to God, but not even to, on the same playing field of power and authority. The scriptures teach consistently what Peter's saying here, that the, they, the fallen angels, are already presently in chains of gloomy darkness. They are not free to do whatever they want. They are presently standing under the condemnation of God. Their power is limited to God's sovereign rule and God's complete power. Which, brothers and sisters, do you see the comfort in this? This is great comfort for the church because we don't serve a God who is not in control. As if everything is out there, these competing forces, and he just, he just can't get a handle on all the evil and the deception. No, in some sense, he's even in control of evil forces. God is not one who, who is unable to protect his people from the attacks of the evil one. Now, Peter's larger point is not to make a point about, about the fallen angels, but he's really trying to make a point of escalation here. That, that if God did not spare these fallen angels from punishment and condemnation, these, these heavenly mighty beings, when they committed this heinous sin, then how much more is God going to punish the wicked false teachers? Do you notice the escalation that he's trying to use here? And the second Old Testament story does, does the same. Peter references what, what Megan read for us in Genesis 6, the narrative of God's flooding of the entire world because of human wickedness. We read in, in that account that man's thoughts and every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. It's quite the, the statement. Meaning they didn't just think and do and act to do evil things, but they desired, above all else, they desired wickedness. The intention of their hearts, their heart's desire wanted evil things. They wanted things contrary to God's law, contrary to God's will. And because of this rampant wickedness of humanity, God rightly and justly wipes out his created people, except for one. 
Noah and his family by bringing a, a worldwide devastating flood. And I think this is a very appropriate example for Peter to cite as he's thinking about and giving a certainty about a future judgment, about the future judgment. The judgment of God against wickedness on the last day. And the reason it's appropriate is because the comprehensive nature of the flood, the totality of the creation was destroyed except for one who was righteous, the rest of the ungodly, those that, that stood and desired wickedness were destroyed. And the reason this is appropriate for Peter to cite is that we know that the future punishment that Peter's referring to, the, the future final judgment is not reserved just for false teachers. No, it's reserved for all of the ungodly. There is coming a future judgment against all those whose sins are not forgiven in Christ. And this final judgment will be comprehensive whole humanity apart from Christ's event. Verse 5, we, we also see one of the two examples of Peter gives of, of God, not, God not only destroying and punishing the wicked, but also preserving the righteous. Noah is said to be a herald or, or a preacher of righteousness. And this is important. It's always been in God's character to preserve and to protect and to not ultimately eternally punish the righteous. He is not an unjust God, which is very important as just an important concept to hold on to as we, as we move on here in Peter's writing. There is great hope in this passage, friends. There is great hope even amidst, amidst the, the difficult words of certain judgment. The, the final example Peter gives is the notorious event of the, of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. These were places in Genesis that, that were characterized by unnatural, particularly heinous sin. The major sin here is, is homosexual relations. These cities were characterized by this sin. And they were places that we could think of that went above and beyond in in sin, in the sin department, with particularly heinous actions characterized by the inhabitants of these cities. And Lot, who is Abraham's family member, went and lived there. And Peter writes in, in verses 6 through 8 some, some very helpful comments for us about Lot and about this event in general. So Peter writes, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them a, an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So notice that, again, that future certainty. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and that he heard. So there's a lot to see here. That was a pun, pun intended. So. <laughs> First, we, we see again this, this idea that Peter is, is using of an Old Testament example of judgment. So in this case, bringing the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction and bringing them to extinction. Just notice that language of extinction. It's extremely strong language used by, by Peter. And this is, again, an example of what will happen to the ungodly on the last day, on the final judgment day. Which, again, it's just a terrifyingly sober thought. But we also see something very important about the character and person of Lot here. Lot was righteous. Lot was righteous, which is perhaps quite shocking to you that Peter would say Lot is righteous if you, if you know anything about Lot in the book of Genesis, in the narrative. Lot is a deeply flawed figure in the biblical story. There's no doubt about it. He engages in some really significant and, and terrible sin. 
He's not always the wisest individual in the story. I mean, he chose out of his own free will to live in these wicked cities. He acts in cowardice sometimes. He engages in drunkenness and very troubling, like extremely troubling sexual sin. But what we learn from, here from Peter is something so important for us to grasp. Despite Lot's fallenness, despite Lot's sin, he was counted righteous by God. He was righteous. Lot was a man with significant faults, and yet God chose him to preserve him, to rescue him, to protect him by getting him out of the city before the, his destruction of the towns. And can you see the good news in this, brothers and sisters? You see why that is good news for us? Because you and I were both like Lot, and that we're also sinners. We also sin. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. We have all done wicked things that deserve eternal punishment. Each and every single one of us have done actions that, that cause us to deserve hell. We are the ungodly without God working in us. And yet God rescued Lot. He protected his life. He preserved him. And friends, just think, what do we know about righteousness? What do we know about righteousness? Who is righteous? Paul says in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 9, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I might, may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone. Our righteousness is only applied to us through our faith in Christ. It is, is Christ's righteousness in us. And so do you see the, the wonderful hope here in this text? We can be assured of, of our escaping of the eternal punishment of sin. Even though we all do sin, we still struggle with sin. But we can have assurance of our final preservation, our final victory, because our righteousness is not actually our own. It's not actually our own actions that we're depending on. We have Christ's righteousness. We have Christ's righteousness applied on our behalf before the Father. And as God always has, he will, he will rescue the righteous. He will rescue those who have faith in Christ. Now, Peter also gives us extremely good insight on the, the actual righteous conduct of Lot. Did you notice that? There's, there's evidence here that there, there was something different about Lot than the inhabitants of Sodom. We, re, we read that, that he was greatly distressed. He was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. So Lot, flawed man as he was, did not enjoy he did not take pleasure in the sin. In fact, he was distressed. He was greatly grieved by the wicked sin of his neighbors. Peter goes as far as to say that Lot was tormenting his soul over the lawless deeds that he witnessed, over the, the deeds that he heard. And friends, isn't this a timely word for the church today? We likewise, as we encounter and engage a society that is more and more characterized by wickedness, we should likewise be distressed over this perverse conduct. This is what righteousness looks like in action. It is to have sorrow, to have grief, to be troubled by the sin that is characteristic of our age, the sin that, that we are surrounded by, the sin that we witness. So, friends, this world, this country, this, this culture should not be a comfortable place for the Christian. And in some ways, we live in a place and in an age that, that is, is similar to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the righteous, right action of God's people, as Lot as our example, the righteous actions of God's people is to be distressed over the state of the city, to be distressed over the wicked acts of the people. 
right? You know, there, there's some voices in the church that would argue that, that really what Christians need to do in this culture is to do everything they can to be in touch with it, to be in touch with the world and to sympathize with the world and the sin in the world so that we can be more effective in our, our evangelism. We can be more effective in reaching the lost as we are well acquainted with who they are. And I'm sure there's, there's good intention here from many brothers and sisters and perhaps some good wisdom to glean. But I just can't help but see the, the contrast to what Peter calls righteous conduct. Lot's distress, Lot's agony and torment over wicked ac actions is actually what proves that he's righteous. Do you see that? So for us, church, we must be characterized by distress, by anguish, by grief even over the sin that, that surrounds us, that pervades our culture. It's not something that we can ultimately make peace with. So just in summary, all of these Old Testament examples, the, the, the sin of the angels in Genesis 6, the flood of the world and the preservation of Noah, also in Genesis 6, and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and rescue of Lot in Genesis 19, all of that evidence now leads to the, to the then statement, the key statement, the resulting statement. If all of this happened, then verse 9 then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. The Lord knows. We're going to take the, the second half of that first. So this is our second point is the punishment of the ungodly. No, punishment of the ungodly. The Lord knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So we have to get a little technical here for a second. And this can be interpreted and really translated in, in two different ways. And a choice is, is, is pretty hard to decide. So the King James Version has another interpretation. We read there that the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And here's the difference and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So to reserve the unjust unto the day. So notice in the, the ESV has the word keep the unrighteous under punishment, which is denoting a present, ongoing punishment of the ungodly. So not just a reserving of the ungodly for a future punishment, but a present punishment as well. Do you see the difference? While the King James translated translates it as, as reserve the unjust or, or reserve the ungodly unto the day of judgment. So the King James is choosing to interpret the verse as God reserving the ungodly for future punishment, but not seeing any present punishment for the ungodly, at least in Peter's mind in this writing. I think both are, are plausible translations. If the ESV is right, and Peter's intending to teach that, that God is presently, so just think about this right now, as we speak, God is presently keeping the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, then that, that would shape our understanding of God's punishment against the ungodly in the here and now. It's a present action. They're facing consequences for their wickedness today. He'd be keeping the wicked under punishment and that they would not be attaining ultimate flourishing in this life. They would be facing consequences for their wicked actions. They'd face punishment of God in this age. And I do think there's precedent for this type of thinking in the scriptures. God is not allowing the wicked to ultimately triumph and live with no punishment in this age. I think that that is Peter's point here. And I think that interpretation fits best with, with how Peter describes the same thing of fallen angels if you look up in verse 4 that we looked at prior. They are committed or kept, so a, a present verb, in chains of gloomy darkness in verse 4, meaning they're, they're facing present punishment as they're being held for their ultimate destruction, being kept for the ultimate destruction. In Peter's context... He's talking about the false teachers, right? 
They are being kept by God right now as we speak under punishment until the final day of judgment, meaning falling into sin and wickedness, false teaching will, will, will have consequences in this life. They will face punishment in this life if they do not repent and turn away. But the larger point is that the day of judgment in verse 9, Peter wants Christians to have certainty that that final day of judgment where God will ultimately and finally judge the wicked and the ungodly, Peter wants Christians to have certainty that that day will happen. Why? Why? Because it's actually a great comfort to the people of God that God will punish those that are deceiving and misleading them, those that stand opposed to us and our Lord. Peter does not want Christians to believe the lie that God is not working, that God is not present, that, that God is asleep. Remember, as Peter said in verse 3, the false teachers, the ungodly, their destruction is not asleep. God is going to judge the wicked. He is going to judge the wicked. And we need to always be sure that, that God, to know that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. That's Peter's point. God has always judged and punished the wicked throughout history. So why would we think something has changed now? Verse 10, Peter gives more clarification of who he has in mind in this punishment. He says, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So again, a reference to the false teachers here. And... This punishment is awaiting those ungodly individuals, particularly here, those that indulge in the lust of defiling passion. And this is another way to refer to, to sexual sin, who, in, who allow for freedom in sexual sin, and those that despise authority. I don't think we should take Peter as saying those that despise authority generally, but those that despise the authority of Christ. The, the ultimate authority, those who deny the lordship of Christ. That is who this future punishment is reserved for. The Lord knows how to punish and keep the ungodly until the final day of judgment. And friends, we really need to feel the weight here of what Peter's saying. The gravity of what he's saying because if you're not here, if you're not trusting in Christ, you're living in blatant disobedience to Jesus and disobedience to the Lord. What Peter is saying is of a sure fate of eternal destruction and judgment, that is what is awaiting you if you're not repentant and trusting in Christ. So the clear call here is to turn and to trust in Christ, to put your faith in him, to believe he is who he said he was, that he did what he said he did. And then you can escape the certain coming of God's full and irreversible wrath that will judge all sin and sinners not found in Christ. But notice this, and this is where we're going to end, this great hope, the wonderful hope, it's our last point, the, the preservation of the godly. So just as we need to be sure and certain that God will judge the wicked, we likewise can and we must and we should be sure that God is going to rescue the godly from trials. We again read in verse 9, right, the, the, the concluding statement that the then to the if, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. The Lord knows is afraid that denotes the certainty of something. Obviously, Peter knows that God is omniscient, so God knows all things. So Peter isn't stating the obvious, but he's making a rhetorical point. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly and that it's certain to happen. It's like saying the Lord knows what he's doing. He is going to rescue the godly. This is his character. He has always rescued the righteous. He has always rescued the godly, as Noah and Lot are the examples of this in his word. The word rescue in verse 9 carries with it the idea of preservation. Preservation. So not just rescue from a present circumstance or trial, 
but actually a preservation through the trials. So it's not that he takes us out of a trial, but he's preserving us through a storm or a trial. God sustaining his people through trials. In the present context, again, the trial he's talking about is, is the false teaching. The trial that Peter's referring to for, for these Christians is the trial of having men claim the name of Christ, men claiming to be Christian who are teaching false, damnable things. And the promise here is that the Lord will rescue the godly from that false teaching. He will preserve their faith. Meaning, most, most fundamentally, they're not going to fall away. He's going to preserve the righteous. He's going to preserve their faith. They won't deny the Lord. And brothers and sisters, that truth is true for us. We will not fall away if we are in Christ. God will preserve our faith. God will protect us. And notice, who does Peter say will do this rescuing? It's not you or I. It's not a human's ability. God will do the rescuing. God will do the preserving, which is wonderful news because we desperately need God to act and move on our behalf if we will have any hope for preserving in, in the faith. And that's exactly the promise of God's word. Now, there's, again, there's a way to read this verse that would come to the conclusion that Christians the godly will not experience any trials at all. That's how some have interpreted and teach this verse. And everyone that's, that's been here for a Christian for probably more than two hours knows that's completely wrong. <laughs> Life in this age is characterized by trials. It's characterized by suffering. And it's a rather ridiculous interpretation because Peter's writing to Christians in the midst of trials. So he's not saying that God is going to rescue the godly from trials and that Christians won't experience trials or experience suffering, but that God, again, will preserve our faith through those trials. He will hold fast to us through those trials. And I do think we can take this verse and apply it to trials of, of various kinds. So it's not just talking about the experience of false teaching, but God will rescue God will protect. God will preserve his people from any and all trials that he sends his people. And so do you see just the wonderful news here? And it's made even more wonderful when we think about what we touched on before. How do we become godly? How do we become righteous? How do we get among the ones whom Peter's talking about in this verse that God is going to rescue? It's through our faith in Jesus Christ alone. By our faith in Christ, the scriptures say that we are in Christ, meaning, meaning what is his is now ours. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. So when God looks down on us, he doesn't see our sin. He actually sees Christ's perfection, his per perfect obedience. He doesn't see our wickedness. He sees Christ and his obedience, and it's applied to us. His righteousness is given to us. It's accounted to us. We get to gain the great re reward of God's rescue and his, his preservation through the many trials we will face in this world. We get that wonderful promise applied to us only in Christ, through our faith in Christ. We will be preserved in the faith until the end, no matter what comes our way then. Because we're, de we're not dependent on ourselves. We're dependent on the perfect, obedient Son of God. So that is the great and wonderful truth for God's people here. A very sweet truth. So friends, God does not change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He will never change. And that is not bad news. That is actually great news because he is perfect. He will uphold his justice as he always has. He will punish those that oppose him and deceive God's people. He will bring certain and final judgment upon his enemies and those that stand opposed to him. And he will, you can be certain of this Christian, he will deliver you on that final day. He will deliver you 
into paradise. He will preserve your faith in Christ. He will rescue you in the day of trouble. Because that, that is who our God is. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we have read and we have heard words of of judgment this morning from your word and words of rescue. And Father, we do make, make us a people that are not afraid to proclaim the truth of your word, even the hard truths of your judgment, your coming judgment of sin and the wicked. And that through our proclamation, through our being heralds of righteousness, that you would bring many, many to saving faith in you, even through, through our lips, through our ministry this week, that you would rescue more and more as they turn and trust in Christ. We thank you for the sweet hope of the gospel that our righteousness is not our own, but is Christ. We thank you for that. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.